So you're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Rupert Sheldrake to the Virtual Futures stage. So for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye in the, over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. The Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and to begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. It's a real joy to be able to, uh, to be joined by biologist Rupert Sheldrake this evening. Rupert is both a controversial and compelling figure. His supporters know him for his research in the field of parapsychology and the concept of morphic resonance, whilst his critics say that his work undermines the public understanding of science, which led him to having his TED talk banned. But for me, what sets Rupert apart is his use of the scientific method to challenge the sorts of scientific knowledge that has fast become scientific dogma. And his approach is of that as a biologist, basing his research on natural history and performing experiments under natural conditions. This work has led him to explore the unexplained aspects of animal behavior and to study phenomena in people, including the sense of being stared at and our premonitions. His latest explorations are covered in his new book and the sequel to Science and Spirituality, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. So to teach us how we might go beyond and help us to perhaps access realms beyond the mundane, please put your hands together and please join me in welcoming Rupert Sheldrake to the Virtual Futures stage. So Rupert, let's, before we get into the book, let's set the scene. What are the dogmas, the key scientific dogmas of the 21st century that science is, is prophesizing or, or selling us? Okay, well, the, is this working? Yes. Um, in my book, The Science Delusion, I summarize the main dogmas of modern science, 10 of them. The first one is that nature's mechanical, everything's machine-like, made up of inanimate machinery. The universe is a machine, animals are machines, we are machines, lumbering robots in Richard Dawkins' memorable phrase. Um, the second is that matter is unconscious. The whole universe is material and it's made up of unconscious matter. So stars, galaxies, the entire universe is unconscious, except for us. Um, and then that's a problem because we ought to be unconscious too. So some philosophers of mind argue that we are, puzzlingly enough. Um, uh, and the very existence of human consciousness is called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind. The third assumption is that the laws of nature are fixed. They were all there at the moment of the Big Bang and uh, they haven't changed since. They just simply appeared at the moment of the Big Bang and they've been fixed, and so have the constants of nature, like the speed of light and the gravitational constant, which is why they're called constants. Um, the next assumption is that the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. Uh, all of it suddenly appeared at the moment of the Big Bang, along with the laws of nature. And as my friend Terence McKenna used to say, um, you know, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the laws of nature and all the matter and energy in the universe from nothing in a single instant. Um, the next assumption is that nature is purposeless. Um, there's no purpose in evolution, there's no purpose in biological evolution, there's no purpose in nature at all. Um, that follows from the machine metaphor, um, the idea that nature is mechanical, because machines don't have purposes of their own, unlike organisms. A you know, car has no particular purpose, 
except to go where you make it go, whereas a horse uh, may have its own ideas about where it wants to go. Um, the next assumption is that biological inheritance is material, genetic or epigenetic, um, stored in the genes or in modifications of the genes. The next assumption is that memory is immaterial, everything you remember is stored as a material trace inside your brain, um, in the nerve endings or in um, phosphorylated proteins or in, um, in other ways. No one's ever found these memory traces, but it's assumed they must be there. Uh, the next assumption is the mind is nothing but the brain. It's the activity of the brain. Minds are what brains do, as materialists like to say. Uh, and that means your mind is entirely confined to the inside of your skull. It's all inside your head. Your mind is in your brain. And the next assumption, the ninth assumption, is that psychic phenomena are illusory. Things like telepathy, the sense of being stared at, premonitions, uh, these must be illusory because if the mind's nothing but the brain working according to physical mechanisms, then these kinds of things ought not to happen. Therefore, they can't happen. Therefore, all the evidence for them has to be rejected or swept aside. And finally, there's the assumption that mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works, which is why our Medical Research Council gives 100% of its funding to mechanistic medicine, drugs and surgery, um, um, and nothing to alternative or complementary uh, medicine which is more holistic and assumes that the mind has something to do with the healing process and emotions and social support and all that kind of thing. Um, so that, and so these are the ten assumptions that are the more or less the default built-in uh, set of assumptions of most university graduates. They're built into the educational system often implicitly uh, but most people end up thinking that's what science tells us. But all of them are assumptions, and if they're believed, people are really believe taking them on faith. So the one I want to focus on is, is really that machine theory for life. Like, how did it become so ingrained, how did it become so banked in at the end of the 19th century that the brain was hardware, and whatever consciousness was, was software, and it had equivalence to a machine or a computer? Well, that goes back to the, the scientific revolution of the 17th century. I mean, this is the principal assumption of modern science, um, right from the beginning. Um, René Descartes, who was really the founder of the machine theory of life, had a vision on the night of November the 10th, 1619, when he saw, in a visionary state, the entire universe as a machine. And he thought that all nature was mechanical. And this was revolutionary. Why it was called the scientific revolution was precisely because uh, the machine theory of nature, of life, and of the universe replaced the earlier view that was taught in all the medieval universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Bologna and Paris and, and so on. All these universities, uh, and the standard view um, was that nature's alive. The earth is alive, Mother Earth. Animals and plants are beings with souls. The very word animal comes from the word anima, meaning soul. Um, so the medieval theology and philosophy was that plants have souls that shape their bodies, animals have souls that underlie their instincts, and we have plant-like souls that shape our bodies, animal-like souls that give us our emotions and instincts. And in addition, the rational soul, which is to do with the intellect, language, thought, reason, which animals don't have. But most of our psychic life is held in common with other living organisms. That was the standard view taught in all universities and almost universally believed. And what made the, the scientific revolution a revolution was precisely because it overthrew that view. Descartes said, no, the universe isn't alive. The whole universe is not a living organism. It's a machine. The earth isn't alive. It's not Mother Earth. It's just a ball of rock hurtling around the sun in accordance with uh, laws of motion. Um, animals and plants are just machines, and human bodies are machines too. The heart's a pump, uh, the brain is a kind of, he thought of it as a kind of hydraulic machine. Um, the eye is like a camera. Um, so this, these machine metaphors got built into science right from the outset. And um, in the 19th century, uh, the materialist view 
came to predominate. Descartes thought that there was such a thing as consciousness and mind, but it, that it was separate from nature. And uh, the only beings with spirit, mind, or consciousness were God, angels, and humans. Um, the rest of nature was completely mechanical. Uh, anyway, so this view then became, by the end of the 19th century, when God and angels were got rid of, uh, you just had consciousness in human minds, uh, in brains. Um, and then the metaphors kept changing. In the 1930s, the brain was a telephone exchange, you know, with sort of jack plugs being pushed in to make connections when you learn things. Now, of course, it's a computer. Um, and as you say, the, the uh, mind is now seen as the software and the brain as the hardware. So I think the background to all this goes back a long way. And this mechanistic way of thinking about nature has, it was very useful philosophy for the industrial age, which made machines the principal paradigm. Uh, of everything. Well, it's weird because the cogs were turning in my brain when you were saying that. I was trying to process what you were saying, but um, what is the alternative? If, if the brain isn't a uh, computer, for example, what is it? it? Could it be a tuning device? I know you've posited that scenario. Well, yes, I think it's a kind of tuning device. You see, the brain, like everything else in nature, is a self-organizing Every self-organizing system. I mean, all natural organisms are self-organizing systems, and it has a ho therefore it has holistic properties. And I think that the brain um, is something that sort of filters consciousness. It affects. Obviously, we need brains. Uh, it's to do with controlling the movements of the body, coordinating sensations. But I don't think the mind is confined to the brain. I think the mind is a system of fields that operate on the brain and through the brain and extend beyond it. Um, as you know, in much of my research, I've been trying to show that our minds extend far beyond our brains, just as the field of your mobile phone uh, extends beyond the mobile phone and the field of a magnet extends beyond a magnet. The fields of our minds extend beyond our brains and our bodies. Um, and I think that's why we have phenomena like the sense of being stared at and telepathy, uh, because our minds reach out beyond our brains and bodies. So, so in other words, a memory could be our tuning into some form of collective consciousness. Yes. Well, this is my. This brings in my uh, hypothesis of morphic resonance, which perhaps I should say a little about for those who are not familiar with it. The it's the idea there's a kind of memory in nature that instead of being governed by timeless laws that were there from the moment of the Big Bang, nature forms habits, and the habits of nature evolve. So the regularities of nature, even those of molecules and atoms, and certainly of organisms, are basically habits. And there's, that habits require a kind of memory. Um, so instead of a kind of uh, external laws, immaterial laws, the conventional view, um, there's a kind of memory within nature. And how that works is on the basis of what I call morphic resonance. Similar, similar patterns of activity influence subsequent similar patterns of activity by resonance across time and space. So every developing embryo tunes in to the collective memory of its species, of its developing form. And then uh, when it's born, uh, an animal tunes into the instincts of its species, and they're kind of habits of the species, a collective memory. Now, we have a collective memory too, which Jung called the collective unconscious. Uh, but I think our individual memory works on morphic resonance as well. If you say, who in the past was most similar to me, then the answer is me. And who was most similar to you, Luke, is, is you. So uh, the most similar person to every one of us is ourselves. And because morphic resonance works on similarity, the more similar, the stronger the resonance, we resonate with ourselves in the past. And I think it's through this resonance uh, across time that memory works. I don't think our memories are stored inside the brain. I think the brain is a resonating system that picks them up, tunes into them. And that fits the facts, funnily enough, much better than the idea they're stored in the brain, because people have failed to find them. What they've found is there are patterns of activity in the brain when memories are created. There are patterns when they're re retrieved, but they seem to disappear in between. And I think that's because the patterns when they're 
created when the memories are being laid down is the resonant pattern, vibratory patterns of activities in the brain which are retrieved when we recover the memory, the same set of patterns, uh, is similar vibratory patterns uh, are set up. And you can measure the, what goes on while they're being laid down and when they're being picked up. But um, you don't find them in between, and that's, I think, because they're not there. They're, the memories are not stored in the brain, but uh, occur by this resonance process. Obviously, this is a controversial proposal. <laughs> well, we had, weirdly enough, we had, the, um, we had the computer scientist Edward A. Lee launch his book Pluto and the Brain, and he argued, look, these transhumanists who want to upload their minds and computers have got the entire thing wrong because memory or whatever consciousness is has no equivalence to information processing, and you see that in biology. You inherit your genes from your parents, but you don't inherit their memories. It must be something... And, what Edward was then arguing was, look, AI will always be a zombie because it would never know how to tune into consciousness. It won't be the amalgamation of matter that would give rise to artificial consciousness. They will always not be able to access what we as fundamentally biological human beings are able to access. How are you dealing with some of that controversy? Because at the end of the day, neuroscientists know as much about consciousness as your theory that you're positing. They just don't know, and you're quite willing to admit that you just don't know, and these are just theories, and we have to be comfortable with a multitude of possibilities for what human consciousness is. How do we become more comfortable with thinking outside of what we see as dogmatic truth? Well, I think what we really need in, in, in science, as in other areas of activity, is pluralism. We're used to pluralism in every other area. We've got a range of political parties, we've got a range of schools of thought in philosophy, we have all sorts of religions and within each religion different cults, sects, um, denominations. Um, but within science the idea is that at any given time there's just one kind of science the whole world over, a kind of totalitarian mentality, which means that anyone who disagrees with it is instantly branded a heretic. Now, this is a, not a very good way of conducting any kind of human affairs because, and, and, and the usual, uh, the objection that I got when I first put forward the idea of morphic resonance was not that it's wrong or, or that the evidence goes against it, but that it was unnecessary. And people thought it was unnecessary because given the mechanistic theory of life and cracking the genetic code and sequencing genomes and modern brain scanning techniques, we will at some time in the future, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, explain everything mechanistically. Therefore, there's no need to have any alternative theory until this has failed. Well, most people think, when I had a wager with Lewis Walpert about the predictive power of the genome, he thought that to predict a human on the basis of the genome would take at least 100 years, and he's a, an optimist. I don't think it'll happen at all, because I just don't think that's the way it works. But their idea is that you can't try anything else until you've d driven this thing into the ground over several more generations and, and trillions of dollars later. My view is that why not look at alternatives right now? We already have alternatives in the realm of medicine. We've got alternatives in every other area. Why not look at alternative ways of thinking of the brain, consciousness, um, the nature of life, the development of form, and so forth, um, and see how those work out instead of waiting for the official approach to break down in many generations' time. It's breaking down now, of course, but um, we're in, you know, people prefer, just won't look at where it's failing. I think this, the thing you were saying about consciousness and AI, I completely agree with that. If, if we've got a misconception of the nature of consciousness and think it's nothing but the brain, then a computer model and AI based purely on computers should do everything that the AI people say it will do. But if that's a completely false conception of the brain and of ourselves, if we're not machines, if we're true organisms, if consciousness works through the brain but is not simply and completely explained by the brain, then it's a misconceived uh, idea and it's just a kind of science fiction fantasy. Well, let's talk about some of that beginning of the breakdown, because historically, if we look at the types of worldview we've had as a human species, and I'm talking largely in the Western world, but we've 
had originally an idealist worldview where we were all spiritual or religious to some degree, and that has been challenged through Cartesian worldviews of the world, and now we have this materialist worldview of the world, but you're looking at something new and specific, which is a panpsychism view of the world, that everything has some form of consciousness. Yes, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I wouldn't call it new. I mean, panpsychism is a new version of animism, which is the idea that nature's alive. And that, as I say, was the pre prevalent philosophy of the Euro Europe in the Middle Ages. It's the philosophy that gave rise to our great cathedrals, which combined the latest technology and architecture and technologies like stained glass uh, with a view of the nature as alive and, uh, uh, and God as the God of a living world. And that's why these cathedrals, as even today, are incredibly powerful places. They have a vision of the universe which is not mechanistic. Modern architecture is based on the machine theory of, I mean, Le Corbusier famously said, you know, buildings are machines for living in. So modernism was very influenced by the whole machine metaphor. The cathedrals represent a completely different worldview. And what happened was that that animistic worldview was... Um, which was prevalent all over Christian Europe, which was the view of the ancient Greeks, which is the view of traditional cultures over the entire world, which in fact is an almost universal view, except for Europeans since the 17th century, the mechanistic theory, which has now been spread across the whole world. Um, this um, panpsychist view is now coming back, animism's coming back, largely because the hard problem of consciousness has proved so intractable for materialists. To explain consciousness as just arising from unconscious processes in the brain involves a kind of miraculous conjuring of a rabbit out of a hat, something totally different emerging from something that's utterly unconscious according to the materialist theory. So the way out of this that some materialist philosophers have found um, is to say, well, if there's a bit of consciousness, even in atoms and electrons, then in more complex systems you get more complex consciousness. And it doesn't come from nowhere. It emerges from um, the, the um, smaller, less complex systems which have some degree of consciousness or mind or mentality or experience. Um, so that view is, is now actually being seriously discussed within philosophy of mind and within philosophy departments of universities. I myself think that they um, really need to go further. I mean, it, it, most of the discussions about electrons and atoms, I think it gets really exciting when you think about big things like Gaia, the Earth, or the Sun. Because if we take a panpsychist or animist view, then it's highly probable that the Sun is conscious. And I myself think the sun is conscious. I, I think it's. Um, I think the other stars are conscious. The whole galaxy may have a kind of mind, a galactic mind, and the whole universe may have a kind of mind. Now, these are not original theories of mind. This is what everyone used to think in Europe till the 17th century. Um, the whole cosmos had a mind. The, the stars were living beings with angelic intelligences. Some of the angels were the minds of the stars. They lived in the stars or associated with the stars, and they were intelligent, conscious beings with minds far greater than in capacity than human minds. So this was the worldview that all traditional cultures have had. And in India today, uh, still the sun is seen by most Hindus as a conscious being. Um, some, many people, including me, do a yoga exercise in the morning called the Surya Namaskar, the salutation to the sun, uh, which is, uh, although it can be treated just as a purely yoga stretch type exercise, involves prostrating to the sun in the morning, welcoming the sun and, and recognizing how important it is for our lives. And most Hindus do the Gayatri Mantra, which is an invocation, a prayer to the sun, uh, asking the sun, the glorious splendor of the sun, uh, to illuminate our meditation. So traditional cultures take for granted that we live in a living world. Panpsychism is a modern uh, philosophical movement that's gingerly edging to back towards that view. 
But most panpsychists haven't gone very far yet, but they're on a slippery slope. And I rather hope they slide down it uh, very fast. So, so, so in that case, what do we stand to lose in terms of just knowledge about the world if we continue down the materialist worldview path, if we don't retrieve some of these ideas from ancient religions, cultures, and spiritual practices, do, do we stand to lose something in the modern 21st century, or have we already lost it? Well, I think, I think some people, have, insofar as they've closed themselves off from the entire spiritual realm, I mean, this is a huge loss. I mean, we're, if, if we live in a living world, if our life is part of the life of the Earth, and that's part of the life of the solar system, that's part of the life of the galaxy, and that's part of the life of the cosmos. We're part of a vastly greater living system, and dependent, totally dependent upon it. Um, and to imagine that we just are in charge of this earth, and we can exploit nature in any way we like, just for short-term profit, which is the prevailing economic and cultural attitude, is not only misguided, but potentially fatal. Um, and... So I think we, we have an extraordinarily inharmonious relationship with the natural world as a result of this worldview, and also with ourselves, because if there are forms of consciousness greater than our own, which all cultures have recognized, shamanic cultures, recognized various spirits, animal spirits, ancestral spirits, um, nature spirits, um, uh, gods, goddesses, uh, an ultimate god or consciousness, all over the world we find people have taken for granted that such things exist and we can relate to them through our minds. If we take the view all that's complete rubbish, nothing but primitive childish superstition, um, that the, it's all just mechanisms that we can understand through equations and physics, and our minds are nothing but physical mechanisms, we're not related consciously to anything beyond ourselves. We're isolated from each other, our minds don't reach out we don't contact others at a distance telepathically. or It's all just echoing around inside our brains. And we live in a universe with no purpose. This is a deeply depressing and isolating worldview. And one could predict on the basis of that that an awful lot of people would feel lonely, depressed, and isolated. Weirdly That's, enough. And weirdly enough, yes. <laughs> Uh, with antidepressants, so uh, uh, kind of endemically, you know, taken by millions and millions of people. Well, do, do you think the the rise of the secular society in the West is directly correlate with feelings of anxiety or depression? Do you think that we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater when we got rid of religion with a capital R that comes with all the aesthetics of God with a capital G? Do you think we've fundamentally stripped ourselves of something that was so wonderfully human in the process of trying to ascertain some sort of knowledge or certainty about the world? Yes, the answer is yes, I think we have. I, I think thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Um, I think though that it creates a, a particularly interesting situation that we're, that we're now in because you know, the religions, all of them have got sort of baggage and they've got historical records which are not always completely inspiring. I mean, some of the pretty terrible things have happened in the name of religion. And the kind of atheist uh, attack on religions, I think, can be seen as having a kind of purifying effect. It's like a purifying fire. It burns away a lot of the unnecessary uh, uh, and probably genuinely superstitious elements. Um, so I think that uh, it's also led to a situation where we now have, because of globalization and travel and the internet and so on, and uh, large-scale movements of people, um, we have access to all the world's different spiritual traditions. Here in London, you can learn Hindu meditation, Buddhist meditation, you know, martial arts, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, you can go to shamanic workshops, you can do Sufi chanting, you can, I mean, we have access to every tradition in the world. Um, and, and that's one of the um, points I start with in my recent books, the ways to go beyond and why they work, because we know how, we can now see that there's a range of spiritual practices that occur in all these different traditions. And these practices are now being investigated scientifically, which helps to shed light on what's happening. 
And scientifically, you can look at spiritual practices from several points of view. The one that's most investigated is meditation, which I discuss in my previous book, Science and Spiritual Practices. You can look at the effects on people's lives, and the effects on people's lives are generally beneficial. People are calmer, more relaxed, sleep better, less stressed. Um, um, you can look at the effects on the physiology, reduction of stress hormones, reduction of the uh, ang anxiety responses fueled by adrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, uh, you can uh, uh, the subjective feelings of well-being. You can look at it from the point of view of brain scans, to which bits of the brain become less active when meditating. And largely, what becomes less active is the default mode network, the interlinked brain regions that are associated with thinking, rumination, worrying, anxiety, uh, and so forth. Um, those get less active in meditation and other regions become more active. And of course, the reason why people did meditation in the first place in India and China and in the uh, Christian monastic tradition, the contemplative prayer, a form of meditation, and Sufis and so on, is because by getting to the very basis of consciousness itself in our own minds, uh, people have found that by doing that, they can become more aware of the nature of consciousness that lies beyond our minds. It's through consciousness that we explore consciousness. And if there are forms of consciousness beyond our own, uh, the way we come into touch with them uh, are many and varied, but meditation is one. And by uh, not by detaching ourselves from that constant stream of inner dialogue and the constant worries and thoughts, we can reach a state of basic consciousness or awareness, the ground of consciousness itself, which the Hindus uh, are most clear about, which is none other than the ground of consciousness of the entire universe. Atman, I'm, Atman is the individual spirit. Brahman is the name of the ultimate consciousness of the universe. And our consciousness is part of that greater consciousness, a kind of fractal of the ultimate mind. And through these spiritual practices, particularly meditation, which gets to the basis of consciousness, we can actually find out something about that greater mind and be directly in its presence. That's the understanding traditionally. So what does it mean, let's turn to the new book, what does it mean to go beyond? Well, what I'm talking about there in going beyond is going beyond normal, mundane, everyday states of consciousness. And all spiritual traditions have the idea that through spiritual practices, we can come into the presence of a greater consciousness than our own. And there may be many kinds of greater consciousness than our own, not just one. I mean, uh, if you just take the Christian tradition, for example, there's, there's saints, there's ancestors, there's saints, there's angels. Um, and then there's... Um, as well as angels, there are demons and devils, and um, bad spirits as well as good. And then there's God uh, with three aspects, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're, they're, the, um, these are all forms of consciousness greater than our own, to which we can pray or form relationships. Um, and I think that the, the what's so interesting when I was looking at these different spiritual practices is how different they are. Um, for example, the, I start this book with a chapter on sports, and most people don't think of sports as a spiritual practice, and yet I think in the modern world it's the main way in which people uh, reach altered states of consciousness that take them out of the ruminative um, mind, the, the, the chattering mind. I mean, through meditation you can reduce the activity of that and come into these calmer states, they don't usually last long because the, it starts up again and then you can go through it again. But if you're in the middle of a football game and someone's passing you a ball, you have to be totally present. You can't worry about paying the gas bill or why your girlfriend pissed you off or something like that. You can't think about that. You ha if you're 50 feet up a, a rock face with no ropes, you have to be completely present. If you're hurtling down a ski slope, you know, unless you're totally present, 
you'll be dead. And if you're driving a motorbike fast, the thrill of speed. Uh, again, the, the, why these things are so engaging for people is they force us to be in the present. Um, and being in the present is the first step in spiritual practices. You, you know, being here now is a key thing in spiritual practices. Being somewhere else and so somewhere else, I mean, it, Computer games. Uh, uh, I once saw an advert on the London Underground for a computer game, and it had someone absorbed in this game a picture of them, and it said, "Wherever you are, be somewhere else." <laughs> well, uh, that's the exact opposite of spiritual practices, which is about being here now. And sports are one of the ways in which people become here now, and uh, they have to be, otherwise they can't be engaged in the sport. I mean, you. you Use sport as an example, almost uh, not just of being present as a spectator, but as a player. Uh, human sports are almost examples of human telepathy. Well, team games involve telepathy quite often. I mean, like um, f many football players, seem to have telepathic relations with others, which they don't like to talk about. Usually, at least in public, so they might be thought weird, but. Um, Michael Murphy, who founded the Esalen Institute in California, um, wrote a book called The Psychic Side of Sports, where he interviewed a lot of uh, team players and found that uh, this uh, telepathy is quite common. Some sports are not team games, after all, mountaineering, for example, or skiing downhill or free diving um, may not involve telepathy because you're doing it on your own, basically. But team games where people are closely coordinated with other members of the team, I think quite often do involve telepathic linkages. Those individual um, uh, sports that you talk about in the book, they, they don't require telepathy, but they require something called mastery, this ability to attain that sort of higher consciousness. What do you mean by mastery? Well, the thing is that when, when you think about sports, they, there's a very wide range of things that are sports. There's team games, there's mountaineering, there's racing cars, there's hunting deer. Um, you know, there's a huge range of things, counter sports. And what, what they have in common is that they involve physical skill. There are some games that are sports, like tennis, and uh, um, there are some games that are not sports, like chess. And there, there are some sports that are not games, like mountaineering. So, but what the sports have in common is physical skill. And people, if they have a sufficient level of skill, can get into a state of flow, which is th this state of mastery. Once you have sufficient skill, um, you can be completely in a state of flow. And this is the state which most sports people find most fulfilling and what they're actually the reason why many of them take part in sports is because that's an amazing sense of going beyond yourself you're now flowing with the spirit the flow and in martial arts it's explicitly recognized because in the east people have always recognized that sports have a spiritual dimension that's why things like qigong and and aikido and stuff uh, uh, link in with martial arts and martial arts are about the flow in your own body, the chi, the flow through you, and the flow between you and your opponent. And, it, and that's all part of a whole philosophy of flow in nature or spirit. Um, so I think that, that that's why mastery is important, because if you're, if you're sort of fumbling the ball and you miss it when you're playing tennis, for example, or, and, and, or you just sort of hit it into the net and stuff, not terribly enjoyable, you don't feel in a state of flow. In fact, the flow is immediately broken. But if you have a great rally going on and, and the goal, ball's going back and forth and both opponents are fairly well matched and both skillful, there's an amazing sense of flow can uh, come about. And of course, that's the reason people like watching sports because, you know, Wimbledon with tennis or or football matches and, and so on, the Premier League and all that, to see people playing really well and to see uh, again, them getting into the flow, the spectators get into that flow with them and you have a kind of vicarious experience of it, an immersion in it. Now, what unites all these different ways of going beyond in the book is that they have scientifically measurable effects. Why is that so important? Well, it's important for me because I'm a scientist and I 
take science seriously. I mean, I've done research all my career. That's what I do. Um, I have a number of projects going on now, research projects, including one on telephone telepathy, which, incidentally, um, anyone here is welcome to try. I've just launched a new test on my website, sheldrake.org. works on mobile phones um, with three people. You, if you're the subject, you have two people to do it with. This is my latest, so I'm, I'm hoping people will do it because I need the data and I want to see how well it works. So let me, a little short plug. Um, for, um, but the uh, research, um, I think, is important. I'm a tremendous believer in the scientific method. I'm against scientific dogma, which I think has blocked the um, curiosity of many scientists and constricted what science can do. But I'm very much in favor of the scientific method. And I think that the scientific method, when applied to spiritual practices, has several advantages. First of all, it sheds light on the spiritual practice and makes it more, us more aware of what's going on in our brains and our bodies and what effects these practices have. And that's important in the modern world where most people think nothing has any value unless it can be scientifically measured and proved. So if spiritual practices are seen as something that just woolly, woo-woo, not real, uh, imaginary stuff, uh, they can easily be dismissed. But uh, starting with meditation, the study of spiritual practices has actually shown that they're beneficial. People on the whole live longer, are happier uh, and healthier if they do these practices than if they don't. There's now a lot of evidence to show that that's the case. So, you know, if, if only for engaging people's self-interest in terms of being happier and healthier. Um, this is a way in for some people who come from a completely secular worldview, um, who are atheists and have rejected the entire spiritual realm. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do spiritual practices. A lot of atheists now meditate, for example. So I think that making spiritual practices accessible to people uh, because they're about experience is important because it means you don't have to start with a belief system. In the past, that didn't matter. Everyone believed in God or in spirits or in uh, other realms. Uh, virtually everybody in Europe until about 1500 um, believed that. And, um, you know, virtually everybody in India today and in many parts of the world believes that. But we live in a world where most people say they have no religion. Most people are raised with no religion and have had a scientific education which puts a high value on scientific a principle and approach, um, which is not a bad thing, but uh, it means that starting from there, um, if you're going to start doing spiritual practices, having scientific studies provides a very good bridge. For me, it's important because I, I do have taken part in all the practices I write about in these two books. Um, so they're part of my own experience and practice. But as a scientist, I also like to know how they work and what's going on. And, and for me, these are not contradictory. They're, it's a kind of convergence of science and spirituality, which is what we need. Um, you know, we've had decades, generations of people seeing them as in opposition. Spirituality is about make-believe and rubbish and fairies at the bottom of the garden and so on, whereas science is about hard facts and things that can be proved, the kind of Richard Dawkins-type approach. Um, uh, which separates them completely. But what's happening now, and what's so exciting and interesting, is it has a healing effect, really, to, to when they converge and um, can uh, be mutually helpful. You said we've seen this rise in meditation and yoga classes. And Do you think there's something so fundamentally flawed about the construction of a post-theist modern Western society that is forcing us to go and retrieve some of these spiritual practices. We know fundamentally deep down something is not quite right. I think a lot of people think that. Um, and um, that's why I think actually we're on the cusp of a new phase of spiritual evolution because um, I think a lot of people are starting out on spiritual journeys now. Uh, and maybe 50 years ago, a lot of people raised and educated in a secular way wouldn't have done that. Um, you know, they believed in progress. They thought the world would just get better and better apart from the Cold War. You know, there'd be just endless scientific progress and it was all positive. 
Now we see there's many downsides to this way of living and in our relationship with nature and in, in the lack of spiritual dimension in many people's lives. So I think that the, the need is greater than, than, and it is felt by many people. And the opportunities are greater. And the scientific dimension um, pr brings a completely new ingredient into the mix. With regards to intention, you, you talked very briefly about human intention and how that helps us to focus the mind, but how is intention or human intention so undervalued? We're able to manifest certain things if we are intentional about them. And telephone telepathy is an example, and perhaps you could explain it for this audience, but also the idea of being stared at is, again, all about this something that's unexplainable, which can be best described as this word intention. Yes, or attention. Um, the, what the, the word intention literally means, and the Latin is in tendere. Uh, tendere means to stretch, um, as in tent, tension, etc. Um, so in tendere means to stretch into. Ad tendere means to stretch towards. So attention and intention both involve, literally, the idea of the mind stretching into things or towards things, which is actually exactly what I think is going on. Um, I think when we look at somebody, our attention reaches out. I mean, when I look at you, I think my image of you is where you are. I don't think it's in my brain. I think we project out images. The world we're experiencing is a kind of virtual reality display, but it's not in here, it's out there. And uh, these outward projections of the mind uh, create our perceptual world all around us. They're invisible to other people, these perceptions, just like the outward projections of your mobile phone are invisible, and the gravitational field of the Earth, which is filling this room, is invisible. Um, but I'm, I, so I, my image of you, if it's there, where you seem to be, where you are, um, my mind is reaching out, as it were, to touch you. If I were looking at you from behind and you didn't know I was there, you might feel me looking at you, and that is the sense of being stared at. Almost everybody's experienced it. Lots of scientific evidence for it now. But within the scientific world, total denial that this could possibly happen because it's not fitting into the mechanistic theory of the, the mind. So it's incredible. Something every child knows is denied by uh, leading professors and scientists all over the world because it doesn't fit their model of reality. The evidence is overwhelming. In my, well, my, in my book, The Sense of Being Stared At, I summarize it, and there are lots of papers on this in peer-reviewed journals on my website. Now, telepathy, to come back to that, is um, telepathy, the natural history of telepathy is it occurs between bonded members of social groups. Wolves in wolf packs um, often separate. The, they leave the babies, the cubs, in the den, and the adults go out roaming over miles, sometimes hundreds of miles, uh, hunting. But they remain linked, and uh, through the field of the whole group, what I call the morphic field of the group, the social field. And it's that linkage that um, provides the basis for telepathy. When the um, adult wolves form the intention to go home, or when they, uh, when a baby wolf knows uh, is in need, uh, these things can be, can, be, can be communicated telepathically. Now, domesticated wolves are dogs, and um, dogs form bonds with their human owners, and this is one of the areas I've done a lot of my research on telepathy, telepathy between dogs, cats, and other pets, and their owners. And many uh, dogs know when their owners are coming home. They pick up their owner's intention to come home um, long before they come home, and they go and start waiting at a door or a window. And um, that is a, an example of telepathy, where the intention to come home is what matters. We've done experiments where we have people come at, they go at least five miles from home. They come home at random times selected by us that they don't know in advance. They travel in unfamiliar vehicles, and we film the dog the whole time they're out. And uh, it's clear that what ha the dog the, the responds, the dogs I've studied, the more sensitive dogs, some only get it 10 minutes before, 5 minutes before, 
but uh, the dog I've worked with most um, picked up when his owner intended to come home, when she rang to call a taxi, you know, said goodbye to her friends, rang, called for a taxi. That's when the dog started waiting. Uh, picked up her intention. And a similar thing occurs with humans. If I want to get in touch with you, and if we know each other well, say we're members of the same family, or brothers, or twins, or something, um, I'd feel a need to call you, uh, I'd have the intention to call you, I'd get out my phone, I'd dial you, but you'd pick up that intention ahead of the call, and you might start thinking about me, and then when the call came, you might say, it's funny, I just started thinking about you. Now, that's an, a survey show about 80% of the population have had that experience, telephone telepathy. Um, or people just know who it is when the phone rings before they look at the caller ID. And now the skeptics, for so-called skeptics, really the denialists, have uh, for more than a century have just dismissed, they said, oh yes, lots of people claim that, but the real reason for that is you think about other people all the time, and then one of them rings and you imagine it's telepathy, and you just forget the millions of times you're wrong. Well, I heard that argument so often from denialists that um, I, I decided that, you know, I started asking, well, where's your evidence for this? You know, do you know how many times people think about others? Do you know how often they're wrong and think it's telepathy? There was no evidence, whatever. This was a pure speculation. Um, so I decided to test it. And in my basic telephone telepathy tests, um, you can see, everyone can see one on the internet. There's one I did with the Nolan sisters, a girl band for television. Um, you have the subject sits in front of a landline phone being filmed. They have four people they know well who are the callers. We select, I or my assistant, select one of the four callers at random by the throw of a die or by a random number generator. Call them up and say, will you phone your friend uh, now? Think about them for a minute, then phone them. So the person sitting there can't guess who it is by knowing people's patterns of life because it's selected at random. Um, the phone rings. Before they pick it up, they have to guess who it is. I think it's Robert. So they pick it up. Hello, Robert. They're right or they're wrong. Uh, if they were just guessing, pure coincidence, they'd be right one time in four, 25%. In these experiments, with hundreds of trials, the success rate is about 45%. The statistical significance is massive. I mean, it's billions to one against chance. Um, so this, um, I think, is an example of intention, the power of intention, the mind stretching out. Now, the difference between telepathy and the sense of being stared at is the sense of being stared at works with strangers. It works with animals. And I think it probably evolved in the first place in the context of predator-prey relationships, that prey animals that could tell when a hidden predator was watching them would have a better chance of surviving than ones that didn't. And so it works with strangers, whereas telepathy is, uh, depends on social bonds and typically works best almost exclusively between people who know each other well, members of families, mothers and babies, um, dogs and their owners, and so on. It doesn't work with random strangers. Um, so, um, but both of these involve the mind stretching beyond the brain through intention or attention. The more I read your book, the more I kept coming back to this idea of, this sounds a lot like what we materialized as the internet. Some sort of global consciousness that we can all tune into and know where each other are through some form of uh, field. Maybe that field is Wi-Fi. It feels like we've tried to build, or at least the original version of the internet was try to build a version of what we already knew was innately there in nature. Is there any equivalence to what we were trying to do when we were materializing our ability to connect consciously across the world to what you're talking about? Well, in a way, many of our modern technologies are materializations of ancient dreams or fantasies that people had. Um, you know, flying dreams, most people have had flying dreams, at least when they're children. And people have had flying dreams, I'm sure, forever. Um, but until recently, something people couldn't do. You could have a flying dream. It could only happen in a realm of imagination or mythology, or you could imagine angels flying or Cupid flying. <coughs> um, 
but you couldn't actually fly until the invention of the aeroplane. Now we can all fly. Um, so uh, now the internet, you know, people have always had the idea that they can connect with people at a distance telepathically. Um, in some cultures, it's taken for granted. People uh, cultivate it as a skill. In our culture, it's completely dismissed, contemptuously dismissed even in, within the educational system as a superstition or as a ridiculous woo-woo fantasy or something. I mean, so uh, the, the, it's mercilessly uh, ignored or, or, or dismissed. But in, in cultures where people have cultivated it, like the Bushmen, as described by Lawrence van der Post, um, they took it for granted as a means of communication at a distance. But we again, we've materialized that. We now have telephones. So, and, and it's interesting that telepathy is evolving along with the telephone because the telephones enable us, they empower us to call anyone anywhere in the world. And we have to think about them first. And then you get this kind of telepathic pre-echo um, uh, uh, through in telephone telepathy. So at uh, the internet, um, the idea that we're all connected at a fundamental level is what Jung expressed in the idea of the collective unconscious. Um, Tyre de Chandon had the idea of a collective consciousness where all human consciousness would be interlinked uh, in a kind of spiritual um, unification. Um, and so both the unconscious, both of these visions of humanity being linked up together again, have been materialized through the internet. But I think many of these technologies, as I say, are actually um, materializations of things which people have imagined, thought about, dreamt about, told stories about for many, many generations. And, and with that materialization, they lose something. They lose the essence of what that, that thing is that they we're dreaming about. It's a, it's a poor version of... Well, it may help us dream about it better. You know, it may actually help us to recover a sense of interconnection instead of believing we're all isolated, which the materialist theory says. We're actually recovering a sense we actually are interconnected. And um, this more interconnected view that the internet gives us is making it easier to realize that we're interconnected with nature as well. And what happens in one part of the world affects things in other parts of the world. So those are all, all, all spiritual traditions talk about interconnection. And for people starting from a materialist, secular point of view, they can actually be helpful in, in, in making us more aware of the reality of interconnection. So I don't see it as all negative. Well, before we go out to audience questions, there's two... Uh, ways to go beyond that I'd like to touch on very very briefly because I think you personally have an interest in worldview the first one is psychedelics and your experience at the Eshelin Institute with Terence McKenna I mean what did you learn during that time that is worth retrieving into our present thinking on those sorts of drugs um, well I I Going, ruling, going back a bit further than that, I, I, my own personal experience began with, with LSD, psychedelics with LSD around 1970 or 71. Um, at that time, I was a materialist, an atheist, um, and um, I, I, you know, had bought into the kind of dogmatically scientific worldview. And this was a huge um, awakening for me. It, it, it showed me realms of consciousness no one had told me about it in, in any of my scientific education. I mean, a whole new vision and experience of the world and reality and consciousness. So for me, that opened a curiosity about the mind and the nature of the mind, which I then took up meditation because I wanted to explore the nature of consciousness without drugs, um, or as well as drugs. Um, <laughs> um, um, so... Um, then in the 19, early 80s, I met Terence McKenna when I first went to California in 1982, um, and Ralph Abraham, and I met them together. Um, and we met at Terence's house near um, uh, Sebastopol, California. Um, and we started talking, and we were talking for 
days. I mean, it was so exciting. I mean, I, here were two people I could have these conversations with. Every few hours, a beeper went off, and Terence had to go out and spray uh, a shed, uh, sort of vaporize to m m moisturize the atmosphere in his mushroom growing facility. Um, um, because at that time he was growing magic mushrooms. Uh, uh, um, that was uh, his m main activity, apart from talking. Um, and so we had um, many conversations. And I went to stay with him um, in the 1980s, late 80s, maybe early 90s, at his um, botanic garden in Hawaii, uh, where he had this botanic garden, uh, you could go half an hour up a lava trail, and it was extremely remote. Uh, it, it was called, and, and still, it's still there, it's called Botanical Dimensions. Um, that's what he called it. Um, and when I arrived, and I said, Terence, there seems to be some kind of vine growing over all these palm trees. I mean, it seems to be spreading out into the jungle. What is that? He said, that's Banisteriopsis, the ayahuasca vine. Um, so he was growing all these um, psychoactive substances. Well, obviously, I tried some of them. Um, and uh, for me, the, the, I think psychedelics have several important things we can learn from. I mean, I, I have to say I'm not advocating indiscriminate use of psychedelics by people prone to psychosis and so on. They can be dangerous. And, I have a nephew who's a psychiatric nurse living near Glastonbury, and he picks up the pieces after the Glastonbury festivals. And so I don't, it's not that I have a naive uh, view that they're good for everyone all the time. They're not. But I think that uh, one of the things they can do is open us to the idea that the mind and consciousness is vastly greater than anything we might have experienced before or been told about in our scientific education. That's certainly what happened for me. Secondly, I think they open up realms of consciousness that connect us to other mental realms that are not just our own. Um, as Terence McKenna once said about psychedelic experience, you know, it's made of mind, but it's not made of my mind. You know, we're, we're, you, if you're a materialist and atheist, you could imagine it is all just generated inside your brain. But these experiences often take you into realms that suggest connections with other forms of consciousness and other beings. And I think help to open up the sense of connection. It's interesting that in that recent book about psychedelics by Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind, uh, The New Science of Psychedelics, um, you know, he's a very good writer, and um, I think it's a very good summary of the early history of psychedelic research at the Esalen Institute and elsewhere, which I was privileged to be part of for a while. Um, the, he, in his book, he says he starts as a materialist and atheist, and he takes the psychedelics, he takes three of them because he feels he has to, to write about them. Um, and he ends by saying that he's completely changed his view of nature. Before that, you know, as a smart person growing up in secular America, he said he thought that consciousness was like a kind of bubble inside the brain in humans. He now realizes it's more democratically distributed in nature, and, and there's much more consciousness in the world around us, and in animals and plants, and changes his view. So I think psychedelics can be of great spiritual value. Um, they can just be tripping and, and, you know, like a kind of just something you do for fun. But I, I, I think that they can actually have a serious spiritual dimension. And they, this is most explicit in psychedelic churches like or in shamanic use of psychedelics like ayahuasca, where it's taken as part of... Um, ceremonies and, and, uh, and as part of a spiritual practice. I kind of want to further go down that route. I, what I really want to ask you, I wasn't going to ask it, but I, I will. Do you think that the evolution of human consciousness is tightly related to our use of psychedelics? And also, do you believe that some of the religious narratives, some of the religious stories have been the byproduct of certain use of certain psychedelics. Moses, for example, was he burning the bush before he went up and got the Ten Commandments? Was there uh, something else going on there? Well, there are some people who are enthusiasts for psychedelics who, who see it as the key thing in human consciousness. I mean, Terence McKenna thought that, for example. 
um, in his book Food of the Gods, um, he has the idea that you know when people are going around hunter gatherers and they discover psychedelic mushrooms, which some did, and, and take them. This is certainly going to change their view of reality. It changes ours now. And imagine taking those in a hunter-gatherer society. So, um, but some people take that to a great extreme. I mean, Terence himself took it to, a, you know, he thought it was the main, or sometimes he said it was the main driving force in the evolution of human consciousness, something that's sometimes described as the stoned ape hypothesis. Um, um, uh, the, so Terence, um, uh, that was one view. Benny Shannon, who is a professor of psychology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, wrote a book about ayahuasca, which he discovered in Brazil. And he would written a book. He'd taken a lot himself. He's done the anthropology of it, the psychology of it. Um, in, and uh, in his book, The Antipodes of the Mind, um, he, he gives an amazing scientific account of ayahuasca experiences. He thinks that Moses and some of the New Testament, uh, Old Testament prophets were taking an ayahuasca-type brew. Um, acacia wood, which is a common tree in the uh, Middle East, contains DMT, dimethyltryptamine, one of the ingredients of ayahuasca. And Moses, after the, getting the Ten Commandments, gave instructions for the Ark of the Covenant to be made out of this specific kind of wood, which is a DMT-containing wood. Well, that, Shannon thinks, is a significant fact. Um, the other component of the ayahuasca, the harmine harmalin um, component of that brew, uh, he pr proposes could have come from Syrian rue, pergamon harmala, Though harmaline is actually named after Syrian rue, which is still grows all over the Middle East and is used as a herb uh, in the Middle East. Um, so, you know, it's possible. But there are many other ways of uh, uh, entering altered states of consciousness. One of them is fasting, it's another practice I discuss in my new book. Um, fasting causes an elevation of gamma minibutyric acid in the blood, it was one of the ketone bodies. That's, uh, sorry, beta amino butyric acid. Um, gamma, uh, sorry, beta hydroxy butyric acid. Gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, is a neurotransmitter. And um, gamma hydroxy butyric acid is also a neurotransmitter and is psychoactive. It's also a street drug. Now, fasting <clears throat> actually changes the levels of neurotransmitters and has subjective visionary effects uh, quite often. So fasting is another way. Um, Tibetans have a practice of meditating in dark caves. And if you go into complete darkness for any length of time, you start having hallucinatory visionary experiences. So there are quite a number of ways in which people could have accessed altered states of consciousness other than psychedelics. So I don't have a one-size-fits-all view of human evolutionary consciousness. There are many ways in which, as I show in my book, um, seven different ways of changing consciousness, and in the previous book, seven other ways. So in other words, don't get high, get hungry. And on that note, I want to open it up to audience questions. So we have, a, we have an audience mic. I'm not sure we've got anybody to run that audience mic. If anybody wants to get a drink or three off me, they, I need some help. But um, if someone from Miranda uh, Bar could just run that mic. Do we have any questions at all? No, you've answered, you've answered everything, Rupert. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. When you are saying about your morphological field or mind being as a field, do you imply an actual physical field, electromagnetic, acoustic, any combination of there of so a variation of the semi theory as put forward by uh, McFadden and Pocket, or do you mean something totally different? Something different. You see, I think that there are, within physics, there are several kinds of fields. There are gravitational fields, there are the quantum matter fields of all the different quantum particles. There are the um, electromagnetic fields. And these fields are not reducible to each other, which is why there's been a long quest for unified field theory. And I'm suggesting there are other kinds of fields as well, what I call morphic fields. 
The brain certainly has, as John Joe McFadden suggests, and as others do as well, um, electromagnetic fields. That's what we measure with the EEG. You're measuring the electromagnetic field, uh, the alpha rhythms and so on, uh, rhythmic changes in that field of the brain. So there certainly is an electromagnetic field of the brain and indeed around every living cell and within all living organisms. But I think that the morphic fields act upon those fields and work through them uh, rather than being nothing but these electromagnetic fields. Electromagnetic fields could not have the properties um, that are needed to explain morphogenesis, social groups, and so forth. So I, differ, I agree with McFadden that we're talking about consciousness as a field phenomenon, but I disagree with him that I think we need to go uh, one field further. Any other questions? There was one just here at the front. Thank you, Ben. Um, hi, along with uh, you know, long-standing interest in merging sort of spirituality and scientific thoughts, uh, one of the questions I've been thinking about for a little while is, um, you know, what and you know, having followed virtual futures for a little while as well, and the kind of stuff you you deal with, um, I'm curious about what could be the potential impact of human consciousness on a robot. Human consciousness on robots. Well, it's a difficult question, that, because, um, you know, the official view, uh, uh, well, obviously, human consciousness affects all our machines. We design them, we make them. They're, every single machine is a product of human consciousness, ultimately. But I think you're meaning something like, could there be a direct mind over matter effect? Well, there are already people putting brain implants where you can get, you know, from the electrical activity of the brain, you can influence robots or um, artificial arms and so on. But again, that's sort of all within the bounds of conventional science. It's an extraordinary application of it. But if we're talking about mind over matter effects, psychokinesis, um, then we're in an area where not much is understood or known. The natural history of psychokinesis includes a variety of weird phenomena, including poltergeists, where sort of ob heavy objects move around rooms and, and um, stones fall from, you know, get thrown mysteriously and so on. Those are often associated with mentally or emotionally disturbed adolescents. Um, and some people think that they're macroscopic uh, psychokinetic effects. Some people have a jinx on machines. Um, the, some physicists were, um, theoretical physicists were reputed to have such a strong jinx that they were uh, people trying to keep them out of their labs because if they went into the lab, sort of the apparatus broke down. Um, um, on the other hand, some people seem to have uh, uh, just a, a, a bit like green fingers or green thumbs with plants. Some people just have a soothing effect on machines. I would, uh, if I was studying this, I'd actually start by doing a natural history of people's uh, reactions to machines, finding people who have a jinx and testing whether you can actually get this to happen under laboratory conditions. But basically, um, the, one of the more interesting experiments on a robot was done by a French scientist called René Payoc. And I discuss this in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, which is my book about the unexplained powers of animals. Um, he created um, a robot that moved according to a random event generator. Basically, if the mind is going to act on a machine, it's going to work much more easily if there's something random that it can influence rather than a fully determinate system. Much harder to see how that could happen. So you had a machine that um, was, the way it moved depended on a random element. And if this random element fired in one way, it would make the machine turn in one direction as opposed to a different direction. He then got day-old chicks. And as you probably know, day-old chicks or, and day-old ducklings imprint on the first moving object they see, they follow it. Uh, so he imprinted them on this robot, um, and the day-old chicks followed it around. Um, then he put them in a cage uh, at the side of an area where the robot was, 
and they couldn't follow it because they were in a cage. They couldn't get, but they desperately wanted to be near it. They thought it was their mother. Um, and what happened then is that the robot spent much more time near the day old chicks. They, it came and spent most of its time near the day old chicks. Um, if you took the day old chicks away, it moved at random in the control condition. So here was an example of their deep intention, their instinctive need to be near this robot on which they'd imprinted, influencing random events within it. So I myself think that if we're going to have uh, human-machine interfaces, they'd probably uh, have to work through uh, entraining or biasing the direction of random events, which is the main way in which um, the mind could interact. There have been a lot of studies on the effects of human intention on random event generators um, at Princeton and elsewhere that suggest uh, rather weak effects. Um, so, who knows? I mean, this is an, an, not an area that most people... Are, there's very little research done in this area. I mean, the whole of parapsychology is an enormously neglected field. There's probably about 12 full-time parapsychologists in the whole world uh, because it's so taboo within academic science um, that it's very few people do it as a career because it's actually a bad career move. You're not going to get on in the world if you do research in parapsychology. I've always wanted to believe that's why England never wins the World Cup. We're just so dour as a, as a collective. And might be the reason for Brexit too, but who knows. Any other questions at all? There's one just at the front here. Where is the mic? I've got the mic. Could I ask a question? Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. I can't um, see anybody, I'm so sorry. I'm here. <laughs> but I can feel you looking at okay, me. Okay, yeah. Um, my question is around uh, the collective and how being in a collective might influence or how does it help us access these altered states of consciousness or that galactic consciousness you talked about? You mean um, when we're doing spiritual... Collectively doing it, I guess, rather yes. than doing it on your own. Is there any sort of studies around how that's different? Well, some spiritual practices are often done on... Uh, meditation, for example, is often done alone. Not always, because people can meditate in zendos and other meditation rooms and so on together. But other spiritual practices are essentially collective. Singing and chanting, for example... My wife, Jill Purse, has been teaching singing and chanting as a, a group, as group activities for, for decades now, and she's helped revive, you know, the, the whole tradition of chanting, um, and um, gives wonderful workshops on this. And so I've seen this um, through her workshops, uh, probably my most intimate knowledge of this comes from that. Um, people come from all sorts of backgrounds, some of them religious backgrounds, some non-religious, very secular. Um, and yet, by singing and chanting together, it, it, it leads to a kind of group connection very rapidly. It's one of the quickest ways of forming group bonds. Um, that's why all religions have singing and chanting as part of them. I myself am um, a practicing Anglican. I go to church on Sundays, unlike almost everybody else I know. And um, one reason I do that is because I like being in sacred places and part of a community and linking to the local community, and partly because I can sing. Um, I like singing with other people. If I don't go to church, I don't sing. If I do, I, I get to sing um, every Sunday morning um, or afternoon or evening. Um, and I find that a very engaging way of being with others, and it's, it's, that's why it's so much part of every tradition. Um, the, then again, uh, uh, one of the reasons I like going to church and, uh, is because when you're praying together, I pray every day myself, every evening before I go to bed, I meditate in the mornings, I pray in the evenings. Um, their different activities, as I show in, in, I just have a whole chapter on prayer in this new book. Um, but praying with other people, again, is a more powerful feeling than doing it just alone. If a lot of people are concentrating their intentions in the same direction, um, then um, it feels more connecting. And taking part in rituals um, is another um, spiritual practice um, which uh, again, is typically done in groups. All religions, 
have rituals, and many uh, national societies, I mean, American Thanksgiving dinner is a, a national ritual. It's not a religious ritual ex explicitly, but it's a, um, a, a national ritual. By taking part in rituals with other people, we connect with the other people we're doing it with, but we also connect with all those who've done it before, because rituals, um, by repeating a particular set of phrases, actions, words, um, often in archaic languages like Sanskrit in the Brahminic rituals of India, uh, by doing things as similarly as possible to the way they've been, been done before, they set up the precise conditions for morphic resonance. So people, when they're doing a ritual, believe that the group in the present is connecting with all those who've done it before, right back to the first time it was done. And by morphic resonance, I think that's what's happening. The rituals connect us with other people in the present, but they also connect us back through time with all those who've done us, rooting us in a, in, in a tradition. Uh, um, and they also connect us with those who'll come after us, who'll do the same ritual. Um, so they're forms of connecting through or across space and time. And so I think that there are collective um, spiritual practices are present in every religious tradition. Uh, we can recover them. If one, people aren't happy with religions, then they can be recovered in a secular way. There's now an atheist church called the Sunday Assembly that meets on Sunday mornings and sings together and has sort of affirmations together. So it's reinventing a kind of um, church. Um, there are ways of, um, you can join community choirs. It doesn't have to be a religious context. Of singing together. Um, but there are var various ways in which these practices connect us with others. Celebrations and festivals are another traditional way in all cultures. I have a chapter on holy days and festivals in Ways to Go Beyond, because these again are forms of collective uh, celebration. You can't really celebrate a festival on your own. Um, it's, it's a collective celebration. And um, Again, through secularization, as people have got, drifted away from traditional religions, all these things which are part of traditional religion have been lost. But again, the need remains. And I think is one of the most fascinating things about summer music festivals is that they've kind of reinvented uh, the celebration of summer festivals. In medieval Europe, one of the most important times of festivity was Midsummer's Day, June the 24th, um, known as St. John's Day, um, like the opposite of Christmas, just after the summer solstice. Um, and it was a time of holiday and celebration, dancing and feasting and fun and bonfires uh, all over Europe. And what's happened in England is that it's been reinvented in a completely unconscious way in the Glastonbury Festival, which happens over the summer solstice, over the Midsummer's Day every year in Glastonbury. And uh, I went there one year, and because it's my practice to go to church on Sunday mornings, I think I was the only person from the festival who went to the parish church of Pilton, where the festival happens, on Sunday morning. And to my amazement, I found that the parish church of Pilton is dedicated to St. John the Baptist, whose feast day is June the 24th. And I said to the vicar, I said, as the sound of the festival came up the hill, I said, you've got the biggest patronal festival in England. You know, In the Middle Ages, everyone in Pilton would have been out celebrating and dancing together on this day. And now people are coming from all over the world to do it in your parish on the very day that's your traditional day of celebration. And he looked blank at first, and then... <laughs> Then he sort of got it, the pen, but he hadn't made that connection. And um, I think that the, the what, what we're seeing is um, um, the, the revival of these collective celebrations in the form of uh, music festivals in the summer. And the fact they're so popular, I think, is another indication of how much we need uh, this, uh, the ability to celebrate together um, and have fun together, because that is a spiritual practice. We have one question just at the front here, unless. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm interested in uh, your report's opinion about the future because um, as a psychologist looking at the personalities, the maybe different theories uh, could be some people are more open to what you're sharing and uh, despite your credentials of going to Cambridge and Harvard, you're still very open-minded. Uh, maybe before you were still tr traditionally following your, your family systemic approach to being a a atheist, but still you found your way based on your personality type or do you think that it's possible uh, to teach more of the teachers to be more open-minded and uh, embrace this uh, evolution of consciousness and hence have a more open-minded planetary consciousness and, and how to do that? Because you don't teach, right, uh, teachers? You're more sharing through books. I don't teach um, teachers, no, in, in teacher training colleges or universities, but... Well, I, I mean, if I'm invited to give talks, I do, but um, I don't have a regular teaching post. Um, I think that, you know, as I, because I, I, I'm quite explicit about what I'm interested in in science and in other areas, a lot of people in the scientific world and the educational world sort of confide in me. I mean, they, I have clandestine meetings with... <laughs> influential scientists and stuff and uh, you know I'm dangerous to know in public but <laughs> in private it's a different matter and the scientific world is full of people who'd love it to be different you know it's not as if they need someone saying to them you know there is another way of looking at it a lot of them know that already a lot of them take psychedelics a lot of them do yoga uh, quite a lot of even atheistic scientists meditate um, so the, you know, there are already a great many uh, people within the scientific and in educational world who are well aware of these other possibilities. Um, it's just that they're in a framework where they don't, in the scientific world, they don't usually dare to talk about it. Uh, whenever I give a talk in a scientific institution, um, I usually have the experience of, no, there are a few polite questions during the question and answer session, you know, often about statistical methodology and that sort of thing. And afterwards, uh, people come up to me, you know, in the tea or the drinks break afterwards, and they usually look both ways, see no one's listening. <laughs> and, and they say, oh, I, I had experiences like this with my dog. It always knows when I'm coming home from the lab. Or, I always know when my, my partner's on the phone. And, and uh, you know, or I, I take an LSD and I have these amazing experiences of altered states of consciousness. Or, you know, I have these precognitive dreams. Or, and they always say, but I can't talk to my colleagues about it because they're all so straight. And usually about five or six of them, by the time five or six have done this, I say, well, actually, they're not all as straight as you think. You know, um, and I said, over there, he thinks a bit like you and she thinks a bit like you. And I, I think you should... You know, talk to them in private and stuff. So the thing is, I see this as a, a partly a sociological problem. It's, it's partly a kind of group facilitation thing for, to enable people to come out of the closet uh, um, about their more holistic views. And I think it's rather like, you know, the gay scene in the 1950s. <laughs> that um, <laughs> there, are lot, there were lots of people who were gay in the 1950s, but they all had to pretend to be straight or or they'd be sort of marginalized or even prosecuted. Um, and it's rather like that in the scientific and educational world now. And I think if there were ways in which people could get together and make it clear that it's okay to talk about these things, come out of the closet, so that it was okay in a laboratory tea room to talk about psychic experiences or psychedelics or holistic approaches to life or even morphic resonance. Um, and it, then I think the culture of science would change. But this is something that is less a matter of going and telling everyone, assuming they don't know it already, is working with what's already there and finding some group facilitation process that could help bring this out. I mean, one step would be to have a, a rationalist, a, a materialist recovery groups on every university <laughs> campus with a 12-step program. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 so look, it's, it's virtual futures, so the last question has to be about futures. It has to be about how we not just imagine futures, but how we potentially manifest futures. So reading your work, Rupert, and 
colliding that with ideas like the theory of time almost makes me believe that we can manifest certain futures because they're already in existence in the collective consciousness. If you believe in B theory of time, the past, the present, and the future is happening simultaneously right now. And these ways to go beyond are the ways to tune in potentially to certain futures. And the only way to arrive at those futures is to have a form of intentionality that drives you towards that. I, I just want to know, can we be linked to our futures? You've suggested that our dreams potentially are the things that link us to our futures. And your friend Terence McKenna once said, look, we don't want to know what's possible. We want to know what's going to happen. Well, should we be okay with wondering what's possible and intentionally driving towards that in order to manifest the future? Well, first, just a brief aside on precognitive dreams. Uh, they're usually fairly short term. I mean, people have these dreams, but usually about things that happen in the next two or three days. I discuss this in my book, um, The Sense of Being Stared At. Um, so I don't think they're a very good way of the sort of bigger picture of the future. I think if we're going to have an intention moving towards a better future, we have to have some idea of what that future will be. Um, and so you can't move towards it unless you've got some vision of it. And um, it, I mean, for, for me, the, the, the vision would have to include living much more harmoniously with the planet, being much less destructive in our lifestyles. It would involve eating less meat. Um, it would involve traveling less, especially jet travel, which is one of the most harmful things most of us do. Um, it, it would involve uh, you know, staying in and building up local communities instead of having a de decentralized, you know, uh, we're trying to globalized, we can have a globalized culture of information, but a, a sustainable agriculture, all these things are part of a vision which I think we have to have. And a spiritual revival is a part of that, because I think a spiritual revival would help motivate people towards this way of life. If you live in a kind of spiritual vacuum, and you're obviously discontented, and uh, it's your f easy prey for advertisers and people who are going to try and persuade you just need to buy this product or or eat this food or something and you, you it'll make your life better and fill this vacuum with consumerism of various kinds so i think that having a spiritual revival and a spiritual dimension is a very important ingredient of all this um so i think having a vision of where we want to go to is 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 really important. The transhumanists have a vision of where they want to go to. They want to go into a kind of beyond terrestrial life. They want to go into a world of kind of virtual reality, sort of computer generated world, and they want to colonize other planets so they can bring the benefits of human civilization to um, other parts of the universe. Well, that's not my vision of, uh, of the future, but they, they, there are, so, you know, different people have different visions. and they move towards them. Uh, but I think those of us who are concerned about the way things are now have to think what kind of future vision we'd like to see and then how we can help make it come about through the way we lead our own lives, how we work with other people to help bring this about. And also how we form an image of it in our minds because forming that intention in our minds, forming an imagination, uh, imagining what it can be like, um, is part of the process. You have to have a vision of where you want to go to, even if it's a fuzzy vision. You, you have to have some sense of where you're going. And that is a product not just of what's going to happen, it's a product of possibility or probability, um, because the future is open, I think, and, and you know there are many possibilities. And which way it goes obviously depends on us. So on that note, I, I want to end with this Mark Twain quote that I kept coming back to while reading this, which is, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And on that note, I want to thank the Miranda Bar at the Ace Hotel for hosting us. I want to thank our volunteers uh, and uh, the team for helping to film tonight. If you like what we do, uh, we do numerous events, including a near future fiction series. You can find out more pretty much everywhere online at Virtual Futures. And because it is Virtual Futures, I want to end with this, which is the warning. The future is always virtual. 
Uh, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking a great consciousness, Rupert Sheldrake. Thank you.